And now here on the 65th Weekly Friday Show from Radio Free UK, we go across the Atlantic to Pittsburgh. With the first part of Dmitry Vasilios' show, this is entitled, Why Do Hillary and Bill Clinton Hate Coal Miner Families? I went on a Thompson Cruises holiday with my family. It was the best. I went rock climbing in the middle of the ocean, had a water fight with Dad. Mum and Dad had a romantic meal. I found my new favourite dinner, and it doesn't have ketchup on. Went to loads of different cities. I can't wait till next year. A holiday that brings you closer. Now with £100 off per booking. Thompson Cruises. Discover your smile. T's and C's apply. Offer must be selected at time of booking. Valid for new bookings made by 3rd of October. Applies to travel from November. Rock climbing on selected ships at all protected. Blog Talk Radio. Well, thanks again for joining us on blogtalkradio.com and on Facebook Live. I'm Dimitri, the lovable libertarian. We're on weeknights, 9 p.m. Eastern time on both uh, platforms here, Facebook Live, blogtalkradio.com. The Clintons have more problems with a C word. Tonight's C word, though, is not confidential. It's not classified. It's coal. Yes, coal. It really astonishes me between Bill and Hillary Clinton. They're both bright people. They both know better. But I don't know what it is about them and their contempt for the people here in Appalachia, here in coal country. And that includes southwestern Pennsylvania, the northern panhandle of West Virginia, and southeastern Ohio, well into Belmont County. I don't know what it is about the Clintons, but honest to God, they friggin' hate us. And they make no bones about it. They want to screw us over. They want to destroy our economy. Oh, don't take my word for it. No, no, no. Don't take my word for it. Take their words for it. I've got the audio here for you tonight. Two clips. Two clips. One that you've heard before on my show here at One Dimitri Radio. And a new one today, thanks to, to Bill Clinton, the big dog, the you know, good old Bill Clinton. Jesus, I hate these people. And they hate us. They really do. I don't know what it is with them and poor whites in Appalachia, but they just friggin' hate us. Uh, also, the fix is in with the Department of Justice. As you know, I cannot stand it when the rich and powerful and the insiders have these great lawyers and they use the, the, the courts and the judges, you know, friendly judges, to screw over little people. Well, it's happened again, and it involves Hillary Clinton and the missing emails And now we find out with the Department of Justice and the FBI, the most corrupt, I told you these people were corrupt. Um, Turns out the Department of Justice gave immunity to two people, not just one person, but two people regarding this investigation with Hillary Clinton. You're not going to believe who one of the two is. It is just mind boggling. But I warned you, the fix is in with all of this. There's the rich, the powerful, the insiders with their lawyers. And then there's the rest of us who just get screwed over all the time. Also, Donald Trump, a lot of folks are going, well, this is awful that Donald Trump seems to like Vladimir Putin and what is the matter with him? And he was on Larry King's show and, and that's on our TV, you know, Russia television. And well, what is this with Donald Trump not hating Vladimir Putin? It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing to me that so many people now, they want to hate Trump for some reason. They need a reason to hate Trump. So now the reason is that Donald Trump doesn't hate Putin. In fact, he's gone out of his way to say nice things about Putin. And boy, the people, of course, the Democrats now can't stand Putin, even though they loved him for the last eight years. And now the never Trump people are going, oh, this is awful. This is terrible. So Donald Trump now is in trouble because he doesn't want to start a war with Vladimir Putin. Think about this. I mean, it's it's just just astonishing. It really is just astonishing. Also, great interview tonight. Uh, Tim Young, uh, one of my favorites. He's a very funny comic. He's conservative slash libertarian. He drinks a lot of coffee, too. Jesus, does he drink coffee? Anyway, he um, had an interview with him today because I wanted to get the latest about what's going on inside the Beltway because this guy is so connected. He knows all the people there. He's from that general area of Baltimore and stays in D.C. a lot, so he knows all about this stuff. So we talk a lot about what's really going on behind the scenes. And out of the blue, again, because I think he was drinking way too much of that really supercharged coffee of his, out of the blue, he starts on a rant about San Antonio, <laughs> not the, not the Spurs, not the, uh, just the city of San Antonio out of the blue. We're, we're having this conversation and, you know, toward the end of it, it's like, okay, Hillary sucks. Everything's bad. Fine, fine, fine. And then he starts off on San Antonio and I couldn't get him to stop. <laughs> it was just like, what the hell's wrong with this guy? It's pretty funny though. So we've got <laughs> as an extra added bonus tonight, 
a rant against San Antonio. Don't get angry at me. I've never been in San Antonio, and I like the Spurs because they're one of the original ABA teams that ended up in the NBA, and uh, they're a great franchise. So I like the Spurs a lot. Uh, but So I've never been in San Antonio. I'm sure it's a lovely city, but not to my guest because he just, like, lost his mind today. And it's kind of funny. So unless you're from San Antonio, in which case you'll probably want to kill him or me. Don't kill me because I didn't say it. I'm just airing it. All right. Uh, let's see who's joined us here on Facebook Live. Uh, we've got uh, Audrey. So thank you very much for joining ah, Lindsay Sullivan Knight, another great libertarian, wonderful, wonderful person. Patricia, uh, we do love you. Oh, Patricia, and I love you too. And a, a, a sort of detached, uh, d- digital sort of uh, non uh, uh, emotional sort of way. I've always had trouble with relationships and, and feelings. I've always had trouble with them. Anyway, Claire's joined us and uh, Kathy, who always hates me, but she always tunes in. Kathy, lose the hate. Okay. How ironic, considering it's coming from Kathy with an I. She spells it with an I. But uh, God bless her. She keeps, I don't know what it is. We have a strange relationship, Kathy and I. I don't know what she looks like. She knows what I look like, cause, unless she's blind, of course. But, um, she hates everything I do. <laughs> she hates everything, every post, everything. I don't think she's ever said anything nice to me about anything. But she just, she keeps trying. And she just, you know, always puts in her two cents worth. So, hi, Kathy, lose the hate. Okay, but uh, Geraldine has joined us. And uh, Brian and uh, Steve again. Steve, great fan. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, great. So, just some of the folks who have joined us tonight. Again, we're on blogtalkradio.com and on Facebook Live. So, let's get started with the hate with uh, the Clintons, this time Bill Clinton, um, and why he hates so many of us here in coal country. Now, why do I say this is coal country? Well, uh, southwestern Pennsylvania, northern panhandle of West Virginia, southeastern Ohio, this is the greater Pittsburgh tri-state area. Big-ass area, lots of really, really good people. Coal and steel and manufacturing, (laughs) what's left of manufacturing and all that, are a very important part of who we are as an economy, as a region, and especially with coal. There's this thing called the Pittsburgh Coal Seam, and it's named for that because a big part of it is in Mount Washington overlooking the city of Pittsburgh. It starts there, goes through West Virginia into Ohio, Belmont County, Ohio. So you've got the Pittsburgh Coal Seam. So when I say coal country, I'm actually talking coal country here, Pittsburgh Coal Country, Pittsburgh Coal Seam. It's all over the place. And coal is, you know, fantastic. It's wonderful. It's cheap energy. It's, it's, it's pretty clean now. It's not perfect, but it's pretty clean. And it provides lots of energy and jobs and all of that. Well, the Clintons hate it. Oh, my God, do they hate it. Uh, today is the, like the latest example of that. But tell you what, let me start with uh, a, a, an audio clip that I had played for you back in March. This is when Hillary Clinton at a town hall a CNN town hall went out of her way to tell you exactly what she thought of not only uh, coal miner families, but also anyone connected with the coal industry and other hydrocarbons, um, other fossil fuels, such as uh, oil and natural gas. I mean, like all of them. She wants to put everyone out of business. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't take my word for it. Don't, don't, no, 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 no. Don't take my word for it. Take her word for it. Let me get this here for you. Hold on a second. Here we go. This is Hillary Clinton telling everyone here in in coal country what she wants to do to us. This is back in March, and this ties in with what Bill Clinton said today. I've got that one for you. I'm the only candidate which has a policy about how to bring economic opportunity using clean, renewable energy as the key into coal country because we're going to put a lot of coal miners and coal companies out of business. Right, Tim? And we're going to make it clear that we don't want to forget those people. Those people labored in those mines for generations, losing their health, often losing their lives to turn on our lights and power our factories. Now we've got to move away from coal and all the other fossil fuels. But I don't want to move away from the people who did the best they could to produce the energy that we relied on. So remember, it's not just coal, as bad as that is, all the other fossil fuels, which is oil, which is gas. And it's it's, it's natural. It's it's everything. And and certainly here in coal country, she's essentially saying it's going to wipe out the industry. 
you know, Barack Obama, when he was a candidate, he said that one of his goals was to make sure that coal companies are bankrupt. And so he used the EPA to create all these extra rules and regulations to make it virtually impossible for them to stay in business. And because that was so expensive, now natural gas with all the fracking is about as low as the cost of coal. But, but it's because, again, the game is rigged because they've done so many rules and regulations with the EPA driving up the cost of coal. So it now matches that or comes close to what today's price is with natural gas. I'm painting with a broad brush, but essentially that's the game plan. And it's to destroy the coal industry, which is poor whites in Appalachia. And yes, Pittsburgh is Appalachia. I mean, there's no, you know, Appalachian Mountains. This is what it is. And it's not all just, you know, deliverance country with, you know, retarded little boys playing, you know, banjo and dueling banjos and all that kind of stuff. It's, this is what it is. This is coal country, Pittsburgh coal seam. And we, the little people, are getting screwed over by these lawyers and all these rich, powerful people inside the Beltway. And this is her attitude. Now, it gets worse because this was back in March. It gets worse because now, Bill Clinton's involved. And let me, let me play that one uh, for you as well. This is a short one, but uh, no less uh, powerful. Here we go. Listen to this arrogant, um, arrogant SOB here. Here we go. We all know how her opponent's done real well down in West Virginia and Eastern Kentucky because the coal people don't like any of us anymore. They all voted for me. I won twice, and they did well. And they blame the president when the sun doesn't come up in the morning now. Yeah, because we, we coal people, we're real stupid like that. Yeah, yeah, you piece of dirt. Let me explain to you about Bill Clinton and, and coal people here. Yeah, Bill Clinton won back in the 90s. But remember, he was running against Ross Perot as well as George W. Bush. And... Bill Clinton screwed over the steel industry in, in well, Ohio and West Virginia um, because he was allowing illegal dumping of foreign steel. Illegal. That's the key thing here. And he did that because it was a sweetheart deal with George Soros. Again, don't believe me. You don't have to believe me. Talk to Congressman Bob Ney because he was actively involved in the Stand Up for Steel campaign back in the 90s, as was I. My whole thing as a libertarian is that you can't have government playing favorites. If the law, if the treaty says X, that's what it's got to be. You can't be playing favorites, government using its power to either enforce the law or to ignore the law for their buddies. My whole thing was play it straight, play it fair. If that's the deal, you got to honor that deal. And so I was part of the Stand Up for Steel campaign. My show on WWVA in, in Wheeling Morning Show was a focal point for all of this stuff. And Congressman Bob Ney at the time, I mean, God bless him. He was fantastic with this. And we were hammering away at the White House at this jerk Bill Clinton uh, and uh, also everybody else connected with his administration, trying to get him to enforce the treaty, to enforce the law. The, I think it was a 202. I forget what it is. We had Congressman Bob Ney on this show here, exclusive interview, giving us the details of that as well as a reminder. And one of the things that one of the reasons that the Democrats lost West Virginia and aren't going to ever get it back, because, of course, now you realize they hate us, is because uh, George W. Bush and Dick Cheney, for all of their faults, and oh, my God, do they have faults, they did promise that if they won, they would sign that, I think it was called the 202, to essentially enforce the law, to stop illegal steel dumping. And I believe that's why they won West Virginia and those five electoral college votes. And to their credit, they kept their promise. They kept their promise. And ever since then, the Democrats have, of course, lost West Virginia and really all of coal country because they don't care about the, 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 the you know, working families and all that. Not, certainly not the poor whites in Appalachia. They screw them over. They make fun of them. You heard you heard what Hillary's going to do to us. You heard what Bill thinks of us. You know, coal people. Oh, the sun doesn't come up. Oh, you know, it's all the president's fault. No, you lying piece of dirt. And you've got Bill, uh, it's not Bill, but uh, Barack Obama, who had said, no question about it. He wanted to drive the coal industry out of business. And he's pretty much done that. So he, one promise that he's kept. Thank you, Mr. President. And they wonder why hardly anybody here votes Democrat anymore. And Joe Manchin is on his way out. Oh, the people just can't stand him. And that daughter of his, that, that, that greedy, oh, geez, don't get me started on her and Joe Manchin. Anyway, so um, again, you've got these rich, and they're all lawyers. Have you noticed that? 
Bill Clinton's a lawyer and Hillary Clinton is a lawyer and they use the courts, the, the, the you know, judges and, and the rich and powerful to just screw over all of us. That's what they do. That's how they're trying to destroy the coal industry here. They're using lawyers. They're using friendly judges to try to come up with, you know, to, to game the system, to game the, the judicial system, the uh, legal system to put us out of business. And they've done a pretty damn good job. It's all rigged. All of this is rigged. And you know it. And I know it. And there's the contempt. You heard the contempt. You heard Hillary's contempt. You heard Bill's contempt regarding all of us here in coal country. Shame on all of them. Oh, my God, these people. God, these people. And so and here's the other thing with that. Hillary Clinton's running for president. And I don't understand the logic of this. You've got Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton both all pretty much pissing all over all of us. In, in the Pittsburgh coal seam area and coal country, and yet they need Ohio. Ohio's a swing state. Ohio's a really, really important state. And I got news for you. The coal industry, especially in the eastern part of Ohio and along the Ohio River there across from, you know, Kentucky. I mean, why would you go out of your way to tell the people how much you hate them, how you look down on them, and then you're, you're going to try to win the state. You're going to try to win votes. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense logically to me. It just, it just, it just, just doesn't. Oh, wait a minute. I've been reprimanded. Lindsay Sullivan Knight, don't knock lawyers, Dimitri. Not all lawyers, Lindsay, not all lawyers. But the ones who work with the really well-connected, the ones who work with the insiders, who are at the country clubs, who go to the heart balls, who, who go to all these you know, fancy schmancy soirees and donate money and, you know, help get judges elected and all this kind of stuff. And then use the legal system, use friendly judges to screw over people. I don't like those lawyers. I don't like those people at all. Uh, Brian is saying, uh, writing, uh, my business uh, gives uh, people access to quality lawyers. And, oh, my God, the lawyers are so strange. Look, there's some good lawyers. There's, there's no question about it. There's absolutely no question. And some, some of my best friends, actually, honest to God, are lawyers. But there are a lot of really bad ones, really unethical ones who, and the thing is that they game the system because, you know, they're, they're very smart. They, they go where the money is. They go where the, uh, the big clients are that have got the big bucks. They can write the big checks. And they use that in the legal system to screw over the little people. It's all rigged. Why do you think Donald Trump is so popular here in coal country? Because he's telling it like we've always suspected. It's all rigged. And there's no accident that Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton are lawyers and they use the legal system, and they use the government to screw over and try to destroy our economy. It's not an accident. All right, let's see here. Who else is writing in? Okay, uh, don't take our cold jobs, not leaving us a way to support our families. Okay, Lindsay is writing again. Um, uh, please don't take our cold jobs, not leaving us a way to support our families. We are willing to work hard. What are our options? You have a hardworking group of human beings uh, here. Uh, no question. But again, it's the government choosing, picking winners and losers. And they're the winners that they're picking – um, Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton, the winners they're picking, as she told, in fact, let me just play this again. It's not often that the politicians will just be so blatant about, we're going to pick the winners and we're going to pick the losers. It's not going to be the free market. It's not going to be whatever consumers think is best. No, no, never about consumers. We're going to tell you what's best. Now, to her credit, Hillary Clinton is telling us, and I'll play this audio clip for you again. She is telling us that she is going to pick the winners and she's going to pick the losers. And for those of us here in the Pittsburgh coal scene in coal country, we're the losers if she wins. Again, here she is. She's just actually telling them, we're going to pick the winners. We're going to pick the losers. That's the way it's going to be. I'm the only candidate which has a policy about how to bring economic opportunity using clean renewable energy as the key into coal country because we're going to put a lot of coal miners and coal companies out of business. Right, Tim? And we're going to make it clear that we don't want to forget those people. Those people labored in those mines for generations, losing their health, often losing their lives to turn on our lights and power our factories. Now we've got to move away from coal and all the other fossil fuels. But I don't want to move away from the people who did the best they could to produce the energy that we relied on. 
it's not often that a politician will tell you, yeah, we're going to pick the winners and losers. And oh, by the way, you people here in Belmont County and the northern panhandle and southeastern or in southwestern Pennsylvania, you're the losers. But no, we're not we're going to forget about you because you did work hard. You know, we'll, uh, we'll throw you a bone. We'll uh, job uh, retraining or something. What other jobs are there around here? I mean, other than working at a at a 7-Eleven selling, you know, blue slushies. I mean, what the heck? but they're actually telling you we're going to pick the winners. We're going to pick the losers because that's what we do. We're lawyers. And, you know, we game the, the judicial system, the legal system. You know, we know how to write the rules. We know how to write the contracts. We know how to write the regulations. We do all of this stuff because we're lawyers and uh, we know what's best. But I should just be telling you, we're going to pick the winners. We're going to pick the losers. You're the losers. Jeez. I mean, it's, 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 it's chilling. And I hate people like God, I hate people like that. Uh, all right. And now again, Bill Clinton, again, this is very short. But again, we're not even like humans. We're just cold people. We're cold people. Can you believe this? We all know how her opponent's done real well down in West Virginia and Eastern Kentucky because the cold people don't like any of us anymore. They all voted for me. I won twice, and they did well. And they blame the president when the sun doesn't come up in the morning now. Yeah, because we're so stupid. We just blame you. Oh, it's cloudy. It's got to be the president's fault. Yeah, we're real stupid. And they wonder why they've lost so many votes here in the Rust, which includes a lot of coal country. That kind of attitude. And they're not even apologetic about it. They're just, they're coal people. They're not like, you know, people. They're coal people. You know what that means. Poor white Appalachians. The arrogance of these two is just, God, I hate these people. Jesus, I hate these people. Anyway, um, and yet there's some people here in the greater Pittsburgh tri-state area, which includes Belmont County and the northern panhandle, you know, southeastern Ohio, Belmont County is like the main part of it, um, uh, northern panhandle of West Virginia and, of course, southwestern Pennsylvania, who still, in spite of all of it, go, oh, well, we're going to keep voting Democrat because our grandparents voted Democrat, and that's what, that's, that's what we do. Well, I don't really talk like that, but it sounds that way to me. But it's like, what more evidence do you need that these people that you're voting for find you in utter contempt? They all but spit on you. You're not even people. You're coal people. Jesus. I mean, did I mention that Hillary and Bill are both lawyers? Did I mention that? Anyway, um, <clears throat> they appointed a lot of the judges when Bill was in office. So one hand washes the other. All right. Um, so there's that. Let's see here. Uh, da, da, da. Okay. Brian has joined us. Uh, Jordan. Uh, let's see. Who else? Uh, okay. Lindsay or Bill Clinton. Don't quit your day job. All right. Fine. Yeah. By the way, have you noticed how bad Bill Clinton is as a campaigner these days? You know, we heard all of this hype. That, oh, when Bill Clinton starts campaigning, the big dog, he's going to come out and a lot of people got to really like him and it's all over for Trump. And we also heard the same thing about Barack Obama. Oh, he can't wait to start, you know, campaigning against Donald Trump and, oh, watch him go. Where the hell are they? Where the hell are they? By the way, did you see Hillary Clinton? Did, oh, God, I almost forgot to tell you. I'm here in the lifepedigree.com studio here at the intersection of freedom and fun. I'll tell you more about lifepedigree.com in a bit. It's a great company. If you have a business and you get resumes, you need lifepedigree.com because they will help you figure out who is telling you the truth on their, uh, these resumes that you get. So I'll tell you about them in, in just a bit. Did you see Hillary's uh, news conference, news conference, um, her talk today, and she answered, I think, three or four questions. It was interesting because uh, you remember a few days ago, I said regarding that big event that they had, the leadership conference or whatever the heck they called it, military leadership, I don't know. It was held on the um, aircraft carrier, the Intrepid, in uh, New York City. It was actually in the aircraft carrier. I still can't get over that. Uh, that it's uh, there and you can visit it and you can actually walk around an aircraft carrier. God, how cool is that? So they had this big deal event, 30 minutes with uh, Hillary Clinton, 30 minutes with Donald Trump. Matt Lauer was the, uh, the guest, or not the guest, but the um, – the moderator, but the, the interview. So he interviewed uh, Hillary Clinton for 30 minutes and then Donald Trump for 30 minutes. And the setting was really magnificent. It was this aircraft carrier and it was all oh, the, the audience was all full of, you know, military or retired military. It was, it wasn't bad. Um, I thought Trump did remarkably 
well compared to Hillary Clinton. Now, Hillary Clinton should have hit a grand slam right there because Hillary Clinton, whatever else you think about her, she really is into military stuff. She's into bombing and she's into wars and over. I mean, she's really a bloodthirsty neocom. She happens to be a Democrat, liberal Democrat, but she just loves the warmongering, always loved the warmongering. God, she's a horrible human being. So, and she was on the uh, Armed Services Committee when she was in the United States uh, Senate for, I think, eight years. Um, presumably during that time, she knew what C meant when it came to um, information, like, you know, confidential, classified, that kind of a thing. Anyway, but she knows her stuff when it comes to military things. And so you would have thought that Hillary Clinton would have hit a grand slam at this event because it was tailor-made for Hillary Clinton. These are her, this is, this is in her wheelhouse you know, the whole military thing. And yet she came across really poorly. Donald Trump, amazingly, um, who doesn't have much in the way, almost nothing in the way of military background or military knowledge, at least not that I could tell anyway, um, actually did pretty well. And really, Hillary should have destroyed him. I mean, really, she should have destroyed anybody. I mean, she's that knowledgeable about military stuff, but she didn't. And again, don't take my word for it. What's really telling with a politician, the way you figure out what's really going on with politicians is watch what they do. Not just what they say, but watch what they do. After this event, Hillary Clinton, I believe, has had two, um, I don't even call them news conferences. They aren't really news conferences, but uh, came to the public twice to clarify her position about you know, having boots on the ground or about um, whether we should tell what our plans are for invading or getting rid of ISIS or whatever it happened to be. And the second one was, was today, this afternoon. Anytime, any politician, Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, doesn't matter. Whenever there's like a big deal event and you hope that you hit a home run, but then the day after the event, you've got to do some sort of a follow-up news conference thingy or try to explain what you said the night before. That's not good. What that means is you screwed up during the big event. Because if you had done well in the big event, the last thing you want to do is take any attention away from it. So you don't hold any news conferences. You don't say anything controversial because you want people to remember that big deal event that you did so well in. But anybody does that. Hillary Clinton has had two explanation news conference thingies uh, since then. Because she not only did she screw up that night, um, but even when she tried to correct it, the first time she couldn't do it, she, she was doing it again today. Again, this is something that she should have, this is in her wheelhouse. I mean, she should have hit a grand slam with this thing. Anyway, what's interesting today with Hillary Clinton is that I, I watched the little brief news conference. She came out. It was really interesting. It was as if she was so, not even monotone, but she was so lacking in energy. Um, I'm not saying that she was you know, tired and ready to keel over this time. No, no. But you could tell the energy level was remarkably low, remarkably low. And I, don't know, I don't know why, but it was, it was, it was really obvious. But you no, know, she answered a couple of questions, I think four questions, maybe. Um, she gave her talk about, you know, what she meant. She was clarifying stuff. And it seemed to go okay. You know, damage control seemed to go okay, fine. Okay, not a problem. She walks away from the lectern. But the reporters are still shouting questions. And one of them shouted a question about Donald Trump. And what do you think of Donald Trump and Putin? And they hooked her. <laughs> They hooked her. As soon as she heard Donald Trump, she turns around. She comes back to the lectern. Now, mind you, she had done okay with this damage control. She had done okay. She had, you know, she did as, as was what could be expected. Not a problem. If she had kept on walking away, that would have been the story. That Hillary Clinton cleaned up some misunderstandings regarding her position in the military, blah, 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 blah. She had her little news conference. Fine. Not a problem. But she took the bait. She walks back to the lecture, starts talking about Donald Trump. You can't take him seriously. And what is this with Putin? And on and on and on and on. And I'm watching this. I'm going, lady, do you not realize what you're doing? 
You're stepping on your message about cleaning up the mess that you made from Wednesday night. You had this news conference to clean up, you know, to, to clarify stuff, which she did fine. But now she comes back and she starts talking about Donald Trump this and Donald Trump that. She's stepping on her message. And so what people are going to remember is her saying about Donald Trump, and this is a written, this shouldn't be a reality show, and what is it with him and Putin, and this, that, and the other? Her message is now, wow, she stepped all over it. It was just an amazing thing to watch. It's like, don't you understand what you're doing? You, you, you're just screwing yourself. You should not have taken the bait, but she did. It was just, it was just amazing. It's like, I know, I know she's smart. She went to Wellesley. I mean, she's not a dumb person. She really isn't. But it, she just keeps making these. The judgment stuff is just astonishing to me. It never ends. Anyway, who else is joining us? Kathy and, oh, Tammy is joining us. They hate each other. Uh, if it isn't a place to vacation, they're either uh, never seen or visiting for five minutes while waving at the cameras. Yeah, Bill and Hillary. It's a really strange relationship. It really is. But my belief is this, that, you know, whatever goes on behind closed doors, it's really none of my business. You know, I don't care what kind of marriage they have or if they even have a marriage, if they have an understanding, if they have a whatever it happens to be. I don't care because that doesn't make either one of them any better or any worse when it comes to politicians. Um, you know, George Washington may have had a wonderful marriage with Martha Washington or he may have had a horrible marriage. And, you know, that had nothing to do with him being, you know, the world's greatest president or America's greatest president, you know. John Adams had a wonderful marriage with Abigail. Well, apparently he wasn't that great a president, you know, but it, it, so it doesn't really matter to me. You know, Ron and Nancy had a great uh, marriage and uh, Jimmy Carter and Rosalind had a, had a great marriage. And I guess uh, Bush and both Bushes, I guess, have had great marriages. Obama and, um, and um, uh, Michelle um, seem to have a great marriage, seem to be very good parents. Um, but again, it does, that does, I don't care. What difference does it make? You know, you can be a good leader and have a terrible marriage, have no marriage, you know, whatever. So that doesn't, I, I don't care about that stuff. Jim has joined us. So uh, getting a lot of good folks uh, joining us this evening. This is wonderful. Um, so yeah, we played the uh, audio things for you. Let me tell you, before we get into this whole Russian thing, we're segueing from what Hillary said when she stepped on her message today. It was so, so, this was like campaigning 101. You don't step on your message. I mean, you can't blame someone else. You took the bait. She was literally, I mean, literally, I was watching this thing. She's walking away, kind of, you know, stumbling along the way. Uh, no, she was, she was walking away from the lectern. She answered, I think, four questions, which for her is like exhausting. <laughs> it's like a really a lot of questions. They shout out about Donald Trump. Somebody shouted about Donald Trump and what about this with Russia? And it was amazing. You watched this. It was almost like if you were a, um, a fisherman and you're, um, you got bait and you're, throwing out your, I don't know what it's called, you know, the fishing rod, like you're in the middle of the ocean because you're uh, in trying to hook a marlin or something like that. So you're throwing out the bait there with this giant fishing pole in the back of this boat, hoping, hoping that the big fish actually takes the bait. Donald Trump, what do you think of him in Russia? And suddenly there's a jerk on your pole. She took the bait. You could see her turn around. <laughs> She had to respond to this. She just had to respond, which shows a lack of discipline because she had done everything right. She accomplished what she had to accomplish, but she just could not help herself. And they reel her in. She comes back and she starts going, oh, no, 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 Donald Trump and you know, Putin and all that. All right, so we're going to get to Putin here in a bit. Before we do, I mentioned about the LifePedigree.com studio. LifePedigree.com, great company. Big supporters of the show. They bought the naming rights for a year, which, by the way, is coming up fairly soon. Um, I want to give some other people a chance. Oh, I should give them the chance of first refusal. Yeah, we'll do it that way. Anyway, um, lifepedigree.com. If you have a business and you have people sending you resumes, well, a lot of people lie on their resumes. They, they just do. And I don't mean just radio people, uh, but like other people do, too. And it takes you a long time to figure out, especially the smart ones, how they're lying. And all those gaps, like a little gap here, a little gap there. How are you going to find out if this person was even in the military? And then if that person got an honorable discharge or if that person was uh, convicted of a crime? 
you might be looking at someone who's hiding the fact that he's a, he's a convict or maybe somebody who um, maybe doesn't have a good credit score or someone who has some unexplainable gaps in their employment or who maybe didn't really go to that good college or maybe did, but then didn't graduate or maybe did graduate, but maybe the grade point average wasn't as good as it. You know, how are you going to find all this stuff out? Look, you're a bright person. You've got a business. You're making lots of money, hopefully. But for now, you're turning into something that you're not trained to do, and that is to figure out how people are lying on their resumes because you want to hire the right person. So here's what you do. You send the resumes, especially the ones that look too good to be true. Send them to lifepedigree.com. Lifepedigree.com is a great company, great people. Uh, they use the economies of scale. They've got lots of people who know how to check resumes. They know where to find all the military records, all the arrest records, all the prison records, all the school records, all of the records you'd ever want. And they know who to call, what department to call to get the information to confirm that the resume is all factual. And so the resumes that do check out that are truthful, you, uh, lifepedigree.com puts its seal of approval on those resumes and sends them all back to you. So now you know which people have been telling you the truth, and so you hire one of them. Lifepedigree.com. Here's how to get in touch with them. You do it by email. Sales at lifepedigree.com. That's sales at lifepedigree.com. And in the subject line, put in my name, Dimitri. That's with three I's, D-I-M-I-T-R-I. Dimitri. Why? Because that way they'll know you're part of the Dimitri ecosystem with our multi-platform uh, blog talk, radio.com and Facebook Live and all the other stuff that I do in social media. And uh, they've checked me out. And so they know that my literally you know, thousands of uh, followers and friends on Facebook and thousands of followers on Twitter are legit. They aren't just hoax accounts or you know, spammy accounts or whatever. They're all legit. Well, like 99% of them. I'm sure there are a few that I've missed, but not too many. And so uh, that way they'll know that when you send this to sales at lifepedigree.com, you're legit and it'll work out great. So sales at lifepedigree.com. Dimitri in the subject line. Dimitri with three I's. D-I-M-I-T-R-I. And um, it'll uh, help you increase your chances of getting a really, uh, really good employee. Uh, again, it's the lifepedigree.com studio. Great company. Absolutely great company. Great people. All right. So Hillary Clinton now is stepping all over her message. She took the bait. And Donald Trump this and Donald Trump that. And, you know, Putin and what is this with this bromance? And this is awful. And blah, 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 blah. Here's the crazy thing with this. Until Donald Trump got into this race, the Democrats always seemed to like Putin. They had no problem with him at all. In fact, when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, she had this supposed reset button, and she had like the, the, the Russian, I don't know if he was, a, I guess, the main diplomat or ambassador to the United States, Larry Onoff, I think is his name, and they hit the reset button that was supposedly going to make their relationship, uh, America's relationship with Russia, so much better than it was with, with Bush. And Bush was the guy who was president who said that he looked into Putin's heart or soul and saw that he was a good man. This was George W. Bush saying this. So there's a lot of crap that goes all the way back here with Putin and with, with Russia and all that. In fact, um, I actually saw, saw the clip here again. I had forgotten about this. Um, right before the 2012 elections, Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, told then Russian President Medvedev, who is pretty much a puppet of Putin, that, well, after the election, I can be a lot more flexible. Make sure that, you know, Putin knows this. You can see the, the, the clip on YouTube. It's unbelievable. And again, you know, it's like, that's fine. That's fine. But now that Donald Trump, who supposedly, now think about this. Donald Trump supposedly, according to his opponents, is, uh, shows very poor judgment, is erratic, and you don't, don't know what he's going to do and all this kind of stuff. Donald Trump has, whether you agree with him or not, has been remarkably consistent about being gracious toward Vladimir Putin, saying good things about him. Now, look, we all know who Putin is. He is essentially a dictator. He um, has, there's no liberties or freedoms in, in, in Russia. And, you know, these are Russians. If you know anything about Russian history, 
they've never had any kind of respect for the individual, nothing like we have here in America with the founding of our country. They always want really strong leaders to protect them, and they'll put up with a lot, a lot, uh, to get strong leaders who will stand up to the outsiders and all this. Kind of, it's just the Russian mentality. It's just if you know anything about Russian history and the Russian mentality, that's it. You know, it's, it's sad. It's pathetic, but that's, that's it. And so there are no pretenses here that Putin is like a really good guy. He's KGB, for God's sake. You know, and he tried to annex or do part of Georgia and, of course, uh, part of uh, Ukraine, with, you know, Crimea and all that. And, you know, we all know what he is. But he's also the leader of a country. And what Donald Trump has been saying quite consistently is that he thinks he can get along with him. Well, isn't that a scary thought? Donald Trump saying that he can get along with the head of a country that has nuclear weapons. Ooh, how terrible is that? I've never understood what the problem was with this. If Trump thinks he can get along with world leaders and he doesn't insult them, I mean, think about this. Donald Trump, now he'll insult his, the Republicans in the primary. <laughs> and Jeb Bush, oh, he just tortured Bush. But he's not insulting Putin. He's not, in fact, uh, Trump went out of his way to say nice things even about the president of Mexico when he was there and even afterward. He actually said nice things about this guy. And he said that he's going to negotiate with the Chinese and all these other countries. As far as I recall, I don't think Donald Trump has ever cursed or put down world leaders, Putin especially. I would think here in, you know, flyover country and coal country, I would have thought that was like a good thing. <laughs> it's like, oh, Donald Trump doesn't want to start World War III with Putin? Sounds pretty good. You wouldn't know it by all the talking heads on the cable news channels, including a lot of Democrats who were plotting back when Hillary Clinton had the reset button or when, you know, you know Barack Obama and all of this stuff. Now it's like, oh, he's connected with Putin. This is a bad thing. What are we going to do? It's just, it's just, it's just, it's just, we're supposed to be afraid of Donald Trump now because he does not want to start a war with Vladimir Putin because he is saying nice, respectful things about another world leader. Oh, my, isn't that horrible? Gee. And here's like the rest of the story. Uh, not too long ago, Bill Clinton got a half million dollars for giving a speech in Russia. Um, and today, this is Friday evening, as I was getting ready for the show. In fact, here's, hold on a second. Here's my iPhone here. I always check it right before I start. And... Um, what, what, was, what happened right here, the front of the iPhone, uh, the, uh, the front of the iPhone, uh, the, the, the face, they, I have like AP stories that pop up here. And a few minutes before the start of the show tonight, tonight, there was a big announcement that the United States, John Kerry, Secretary of State John Kerry, reached an agreement with Putin, with Russia, so that they will work together in Syria. And the deal is pretty much this. They both get to bomb different, you know, different groups of people there. And it's all a war thing. But this evening, as I was ready to start talking with you about, well, isn't this a terrible thing that, you know, Donald Trump seems to be respectful and actually like Putin. Here, you've got this administration. Hillary Clinton's, um, um, the person who took over her position, her um, successor, John Kerry, announcing tonight, tonight he announces this that they've reached an agreement with Russia to go into Syria. And this is the thing that Donald Trump had been saying all along. It's like, hey, if the Russians want to go into Syria and, you know, try to kill off ISIS and all that, sounds good to me. He's always been saying that, and they've always been giving him grief about this. And here tonight, tonight, that's the announcement from this administration. And you wonder why I'm going back here going, what the hell, what's wrong with these people? One minute they're telling us this, the next minute they're doing that. It's like, what? It, it, it makes me nuts. It just makes me nuts. Anyway, so um, this is turning into a really interesting election. So far, this Kellyanne Conway has really reined in Trump and has uh, softened him a lot in, in his messaging. And so um, this guy, um, he might pull this off. I mean, it's still unlikely because the elites 
have determined that Hillary Clinton is going to be the next president. I mean, the coronation is all but official, but there's still 60 days to go. I mean, can Trump actually pull this thing off? Uh, some of the latest polling now, Quinnipiac poll and all that, is indicating the race is really tightened. And when you think about this, think about how the media has trashed Trump, sometimes rightly and sometimes not. But either way, I mean, they've just been all just dumping on him, whatever. Plus, Hillary Clinton has been spending tens of millions of dollars, especially in the swing states, trying to win over votes and, you know, get and, you know, just have huge leads by all rights with around around 60 days to go before the election. Hillary Clinton should be leading by about 50 points in every state because everything has been going wrong for Trump and everything's supposedly going right for Hillary. And she's got, you know, the media behind her. She's got, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that she's spending. She should be up by 50 points. And yet it's a virtual tie and, you know, nationwide and in many, not all, but in many of the swing states. If I'm the Hillary Clinton campaign and I'm looking at these latest poll numbers, the Quinnipiac and the Suffolk poll and all that, I'm going, holy God, what do we have to do here? What do we have to do? So um, God, can Trump actually pull this off? I mean, because the elites have made it clear this is a coronation for Hillary. But th- there's, no, there's no question about this. There's absolutely no question about this. But anyway, Nicholas has joined us, and to Jimmy and John and to Fran, so thank you all very much. I appreciate that uh, greatly. Now, um, something that you may not have heard. I've been telling you about this for a very long time now, and that is the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation. The, the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, I've been telling you, reminding you, that it has been corrupt from essentially its founding with J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover was one of the most corrupt, vile politicians, even though he was never elected, um, uh, who's ever been part of our government. J. Edgar Hoover was a wretched, horrible human being, but he was in charge of this FBI, and he was very good about uh, publicity and images. So the imaging of the FBI has always been good because they're supposed to be, you know, very clean cut and uh, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, and you know, we'll get this information. We're college graduates. And, you know, then he's, he was always very good about the image. But when you learned anything about the FBI, you realized that it was hopelessly, uh, it was just a hopeless political whore that was used by whatever party was in office. It's essentially the federal police is what it is. But really, they dress very conservatively, very short haircuts, the women very short hair and, you know, very uh, precise. And you would think that they're like accountants or something like that. They aren't. They're the FBI. And it's they're just it's a political whore organization. Um, and I've been giving lots of different examples of this. that has um, gone, gone back over the years, whether it's the FBI crime lab. They just made up stuff to throw people in jail, the FBI crime lab. And they've been in bed with uh, mobsters like Waddy Bulger, giving him permission to kill other people so that he can, they can still get good information from him. Uh, recently, they had this sting operation where the FBI was distributing child pornography all across the internet, trying to lure in pervs and all that. But it was the FBI distributing kitty porn, uh, but it was for a good cause. So, and it's the FBI, so it's okay then. And what else have they done? Uh, well, of course, Ruby Ridge and uh, Waco and all the deaths there, all the crazy deaths there. More recently, the IRS investigation into the Tea Party and the targeting of the Tea Party. The FBI says, oh, yeah, nothing looks out of place here. Everything looks fine. And, of course, now the Hillary Clinton thing with the emails and the server and the, and the foundation and James Comey saying, well, yeah, she broke a lot of laws, but we're not going to recommend anything because you know, the fix is in. With all of these people, and Comey's a lawyer too, by the way, uh, the fix is in. And I told you it was in a long, long time ago because Bill Clinton had said, in, and not Bill Clinton, Barack Obama had said in different interviews that, you know, there's not a smidgen of evidence that anything was wrong while the investigations were still going on. And so the fix was in. That's it. And I said, you know, the FBI, if you're ever on a jury and you have an FBI special agent testifying, don't you ever believe him or her unless that person his or her testimony can be corroborated in some other way. If the FBI agent is on, tri- not on trial, but as a witness, um, and you're on the jury, you're on a jury, and the FBI agent there is going, you know, yes, the sun rises in the morning. Don't you believe it? Get independent confirmation. Do a Google search if they'll let you, if the judge will let you, or do something else to make sure that the sun actually rises in the east in the morning. Because just because the FBI special agent, they're not just agents, they're special agents, Uh, Just because they say it doesn't mean that it's true. They lie. And here's the latest. 
you probably have not heard this, but I'll share this with you because well, you probably haven't heard this. Here's the latest with the FBI and the Department of Justice. Again, it's all the same thing. Just a bunch of whore lawyers who are gaming the system um, to protect the powerful people, in this case, Hillary Clinton. The, um, the investigation, what there was of it with the uh, FBI for the uh, Hillary Clinton emails and all that, the, um, <clears throat> there was a story not, not that long ago where the investigation, one of the uh, Hillary Clinton people, an IT guy, got immunity. Got, um, they essentially said, okay, if you confess and tell us everything, then we're not going to press charges. It'll be immunity. And uh, they worked out a deal with him. But nothing ever came of it. There was no grand jury. There was no, um, um, any, no other you know, uh, arrests or anything like that or charges to anyone else and all that. And that was bad enough. But now we find out uh, today, as a matter of fact, I found out today. This may have, you know, may have happened a few days ago, but I think it happened today. Now we find out that the Department of Justice, which is, again, essentially part – the FBI is part of the Department of Justice. It's all the same inbred lawyer whore thing. Turns out that the Department of Justice gave a, another person in Hillary's uh, uh, you know, web of intrigue with the emails uh, immunity. And it wasn't just any other person. It was the person. I hope you're sitting down listening to this, especially if you're driving. It was the person who destroyed all the emails. They gave him the immunity too, in addition to the other guy from months ago. And so now the person who you would, is like the last person you'd want to give immunity to, now he's free. There's nothing he can do. There's nothing that Congress can do. Again, the fix is in. When you have smart lawyers who know how to game the system, who have friendly judges, and everybody knows that the fix is in, <clears throat> this kind of stuff happens. And I'm guessing that the establishment media is going to downplay this story, or some of the establishment media is going to pretty much ignore it. But this is the latest. This is what they did now. They gave immunity to the guy who destroyed all the emails. I mean, it's just, it's just mind-boggling. You can't trust anyone. Everything is rigged, and we here in cold country are the ones who are getting shit on by all these lawyers and judges and then the, and the, and the legal system. And, uh, you know, you, you hear me talk about this so much because it makes me so angry. And, and, but that's the latest. That's what's going on. Anyway, uh, Brian is uh, writing in the emails is what made me switch against the two parties. Yeah, no kidding. Absolutely no kidding. Um, I don't know how well my candidate's going to do. Um, Libertarian Party candidate Gary Johnson. Gary Johnson is not the ideal candidate. Uh, far from it. But in this election year, uh, the Republicans, and there are many Republicans who say that Donald Trump is certainly not the ideal Republican, and many Democrats say that Hillary Clinton is not the ideal Democrat. So when it comes to these three parties, and I can't speak to the Green Party, maybe Jill Stein is like their perfect uh, candidate. I just don't know. Dr. Dr. Jill Stein. But I do know of these three. And even though I will absolutely vote for Libertarian Party candidates, because that's, that's the only thing I do, I'll be the first to admit <clears throat> Gary Johnson is far from an ideal libertarian. <laughs> he's far from it. On his worst day, and he's had some bad days, but on his worst day, Libertarian Party candidate Gary Johnson is still light years better than any other of the old party candidates, except Rand Paul. Rand Paul would have been great, but you know, he wasn't going to get the nomination, so you know, what are you going to do? Anyway, all right. Well, I've been talking, I think, uh, quite a bit, uh, and I know I have uh, quite a bit tonight. Um, an update from last night. The wife is back in town, and um, I'd sprayed everything with a raid and to kill all the bugs and everything here in the house because I had, you know, some little gnat things flying around. And um, it was like this fog, raid fog throughout the house. Well, it's finally dissipated. I'm getting most of my voice back, and most importantly, the bugs are gone, so that's worked out well. Anyway, Rick has joined us, so that's great uh, too. So, okay, the interview that I have for you tonight, we did earlier today, and that is uh, with Tim Young. Tim Young is a comic who's very funny. He's a conservative slash libertarian. There's a lot of, he, uh, a lot of that stuff. And um, he made some big announcements today about a big publication, some new thing that I think you're going to like. But he also, he's based inside the Beltway. He's in Washington, D.C. He knows all the players. They tell him all this stuff. And so I uh, talked with him about 
Hillary Clinton, the FBI, and all this. Tim Young is also a lawyer, and so he understands it from a legal point of view. Uh, but he's a good lawyer. He's one of the good ones because he doesn't represent the fat cats who game the system to try to screw over a little guy. Tim Young's okay. He's one of the good guys. So great interview. And then toward the end of the interview, it, it just veered off in a very strange, strange direction. Tim was drinking coffee today. Not just any coffee, but super duper high octane coffee. That was, uh, he'll explain it, but it's like really manly coffee. You know, you take a sip and suddenly you're growing, you know, hair out of your, I don't know, your eyeballs or something like that. Well, apparently he had too much coffee today because toward the end of the interview, and I don't know how we got to this point, but somehow, some way, we mentioned, one of us mentioned San Antonio. Now, what that has to do with anything that we had been talking about, I'll never know. But somehow, San Antonio came up. It's a city in Texas where they have the Spurs. It's a very good basketball um, organization. Tim Young lost his mind. He lost his mind regarding San Antonio. He went off on a, like a 10-minute rant about San Antonio, how it's the most god-awful city in the world and everything is terrible and wrong about it. It was like, oh my God, this guy's lost his mind. It was kind of funny, but it was funny in a scary kind of, let me stay away from him sort of way. Anyway, so we've got that on the interview here as well. Uh, Keith has joined us uh, finally a little late tonight. Keith, uh, Jeff, uh, they hate uh, whoever disagrees with them. The Clintons, absolutely. Uh, Jeffrey, uh, of course, joining us. And Rick, I mentioned that. So, um, all right, so we've got that. We'll do that interview. I'll air that. Um, and then we'll wrap up for tonight and for this week. And what we do when we wrap up with a Facebook Live part of our interplay here, of our multimedia platform, I always ask my Facebook friends to do the grand finale, which is the grand, the emoji grand finale. And that is to have you all start sending as many emojis as you can. So it's just the screen is just filled with all these different emojis, the happy, the sad, the crying, the, you know, the surprise, the the thumbs up, the hearts, all of it, just at the same time. It's just a little tradition that we do. And I keep reminding myself, or I keep saying that I'm going to remind myself to come up with some music or something so we can add some music to it, because I don't think we can add music to it just with the Facebook, although you know, music might be coming. I mean, who knows? But we've got to, I've got to figure out some way to make this thing even better than what it is. Anyway, so let's do the, uh, by the way, if you, that's okay, that's the start, that's the start. <clears throat> Please follow me on Facebook, and also share this. Oh, Lindsay, thank you so much. You're the best. It's going to be coming across the screen, though. That's the way it's going to work. And so uh, please share this with other people so that many, many people know about us. That would be fantastic. Uh, follow me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. I've got uh, thousands, literally well, 12,000 uh, followers on Twitter and 5,500 friends and followers on Facebook and hundreds of downloads and all that. So just keep spreading the word because a lot of people are getting onto this thing. I mean, they're actually understanding it. They're getting it. And this is a wonderful thing. And all these emojis are, are great. So, okay, let's get all the emojis going here right now. And we'll do the Tim Young uh, interview. Hold on a second here. 